talking about trust at the European level. Um, uh, it's kind of, my field is more global um, analyses and I, I kind of get confined in the European context. So it's going to be more, I think, about mistrust in the global context. Um, and some of it is going to be um, fitting into what with, prof with what Professor um, Petekesh said this morning. There was some overlap, and you will see even with this, it's a little bit of a different chart than he showed, but um, I will explain that in a minute. It reveals the same type of thing that I wanted to talk about. But I wanted to start out by mentioning that three weeks ago, um, the, Secretary, uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, spoke at a press conference about the UN's top priorities for 2020. And he identified what he called the four men of the apocalypse, yeah, um, that are threatening the world today. The first is the climate crisis, then there is the rising geopolitical tensions, the misuse of technology, and global mistrust. So global mistrust is at the front lines of, of the UN's priorities for 2020. Um, in one sense, trust is really the glue of life, and it's the most essential ingredient um, for effective communication and the foundations um, that holds all of our relationships together. So trust is extremely important in our societies as a kind of glue that holds us together. It's indispensable um, for the way we deal in our daily lives, but it can also be damaging. Okay? We didn't, hadn't brought that up yet. Without trusting others, we can't function in society or even stay alive for very long alone. But being overly trustful can also be a bad strategy. Um, trust is very pragmatic, um, but it also has a moral dimension, and I wanted to kind of concentrate on that here. Trustworthiness is a virtue, and well-placed trust benefits all of us. And that's why I think sometimes we get the argumentation backwards. We're talking about trust when we should be talking about trustworthiness. So why do we value trust and why do we want to be trusted? Um, trust is important both in personal and public spheres, including in family and all different kinds of personal relationships, as well as in politics and society. So how does our attitude to trust and distrust apply to our relationships with institutions, with public figures, and with social groups? So what is the difference between trusting a politician and trusting a government? How do we decide who to trust in the public eye? So there are certain standard ideas that people have about trust these days, and I want to go through them. The first one is a claim. The claim is that there has been a great decline in trust. I'm sure all of you have heard that and kind of accepted that as a, as a notion. Then there is an aim. So if we, ha if we have a decline in trust, what do we need? What should we be aiming for? More trust. Yeah, that's what everybody is, is asking for. We need to have more trust. So what's the task that we set before us? It's how to rebuild trust. So we have a claim, we have an aim, and we have a task. And we hear about this repeated in different ways in the media, in newspapers, on the internet, um, in different, with different uses of different kinds of metaphors and languages all the time. So why do we think trust has declined? Where do we get the idea that trust has declined? Where have you heard this? What proof do they show that trust has actually declined? What do they usually give you as a, as a you know, evidence that trust has declined? Surveys. Yeah, surveys, polls, things like that. And maybe trust has declined you know, in certain activities and in some institutions. <laughs> And it might have grown in others, but we never get that kind of um, more detailed, um, analytical um, uh, approach to these polls and these surveys that we have shown. So opinion polls are supposed to be the evidence on which this claim is made. And if you look at this claim over time, 
People like journalists and politicians that were not trusted 20 years ago are still mistrusted. So there has not been much of a change over time in, in who we don't trust. <clears throat> On the other side, people that are highly trusted are actually scientists. You know, you hear this a lot, um, especially in a lot of right-wing American propaganda that people don't trust scientists. Well, maybe in certain sectors of the American, you know, uh, society, they don't trust scientists, but generally speaking, people trust scientists actually the most. And then after that, we have doctors and nurses, teachers, ordinary people, judges, who are still highly trusted. So opinion polls record opinions, right? But in our real lives, we have to make strategic decisions and di differentiate our trust. So we can, for example, trust a school teacher in a classroom, but we might not trust that teacher to drive the school bus after school. Or we may trust a public figure as an entertaining television personality, but not as a president of an important country in the world. So the problem with polls is that they eliminate the differential judgments that people make every day regarding who they trust. And so this is why, this is, um, why um, I question why we drop this differentiated trust that we perform daily when we try to look at more trust abstractly. So in terms of what we should aim to have more trust in is the trustworthy. We need to place more trust in those we find trustworthy and less trust in those who are less trustworthy. So intelligently placed and intelligently refused trust is maybe a better aim than simply having more trust. So what matters most of all is not trust, but trustworthiness by judging how trustworthy people and institutions are. And this requires us to ask the following questions. And Professor Ketakesh mentioned some of these um, this morning. Are they competent? Are they honest? And are they reliable? So if they have these qualities, then we have a good reason to trust them and judge them as trustworthy. So trustworthiness is what we are looking for. And placing our trust in something or someone is our response. When we find someone or something trustworthy, they acquire our trust. So over the past decades, we have tried to construct <coughs> systems of accountability for institutions and professionals to make it easier for us to judge if they are trustworthy. We have a lot of rules, regulations. If you ever have an EU um, application and you have filing procedures, you know all of the acrobatics you have to go through to prove that you are trustworthy when you receive money from the EU. So a lot of these systems are not working and do not work the way they're supposed to work. And in fact, governance and oversight of, for example, financial systems, international organizations, domestic politics, and elections has never been so non-transparent, blurred, and unaccountable as they are today, even with all of these procedures and rules that we have set down. So if we look at the task of rebuilding trust, this is also getting the picture, I think, backwards. Trust is distinctive because it is given by other people, and you cannot rebuild what other people give you. So you can't re seek to rebuild trust because it's something that you receive when you are deemed trustworthy. So you have to give them the basis um, on which to trust you, and this also applies to institutions. You have to provide usable evidence that you are trustworthy. And how do you do this? How do you do this, you know, on a personal level? And then we can kind of transpose that to um, larger, um, to larger institutional levels. Well, I mean, personally, if you make yourself vulnerable by revealing your strengths and your weaknesses, and you admit to your faults and mistakes to another party, and this includes organizations and institutions, then it's pretty good evidence that you are trustworthy. You are willing to admit that you can make mistakes or that you were wrong. How many of these, and, and, and just think about that, how many of these international organizations or international frameworks 
ever come out and say, we made a mistake. <laughs> or persons, yeah. <laughs> so what we should aim for in relationships is trustworthiness. And we need to think less about trust, let alone attitudes towards trust that are detected or misdetected by opinion polls. <clears throat> We need to think much more about being trustworthy and how you give people adequate, useful, and simple evidence of your trustworthiness. So I would now like to get into the topic of the impact of technology on trust and trustworthiness, because technology is creating new mechanisms that allow us to trust and mistrust. So how many of you, for example, have ever used Airbnb? Just raise your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it works in about 190 countries now. Um, how many of you have used Uber? Here we go. Um, what about ride sharing? It's kind of the same. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin. None of us are rich enough, I think, for Bitcoin yet. But anyway, this is this is pretty. Makes a pretty. Gives us a pretty clear picture. So at the same time that we are um, using these services. Trust in institutions like banks and governments and even religious authorities and institutions is collapsing or declining. So what is happening here? In whom and what do we trust? It's the title of this winter school. What is a leap of trust? Well, I think it is when we take the risk of trying something new or different from the way that we've always been doing something. For you to take a leap from a place of certainty into the unknown, to take a chance on someone or something unknown, you need, to, you need a kind of force to pull you over the gap between certainty and uncertainty. And that, I believe, is trust. And you all took a leap by coming to Kursag for this winter school. So you know what I mean by trust. You looked at the evidence of what we put out there for you. You maybe knew people who had been here before. And so you took that leap based on your judgment that this is a trustworthy endeavor. So trust is very hard to define. Um, yet we depend on it um, for our lives to function. Um, and generally, definitions um, call trust a kind of risk assessment as to how much we think things will go right. But this definition um, makes placing trust sound kind of too much like a rational thinking process that is predictable. It's not predictable. And it, it doesn't get to the kind of human essence of trust that makes us able to function in our daily lives and connect to other people. So one of the people doing research on, on trust is a woman named Rachel Botsmas. And she defined trust, I liked her definition of trust. She called it confident relationship to the unknown. So a confident relationship to the unknown. And this definition enables us to better understand how we, we are able to cope with uncertainty. Without trust, we are not able to cope with uncertainty. Uncertainty is one of the, the, um, one of the main slogans of I ask. How we survive, how we are resilient when we're faced with uncertainties. And technology is changing the social glue of society, and there is a lot we do we don't know about trust. Like, for example, do men and women trust differently? That's a very good question. Um, how does trust translate online? Um, does trust transfer from one social media platform to another? So three levels of trust building have been identified by, by researchers in terms of the new technologies. And the first is that you have to have trust in the idea, okay? Now we all had trust in Facebook at one time, we all had trust in Google at one time, but of course there are, there are problems. So that's the first thing, you have to have trust in the idea. Second, you need to trust in the platform. And third is trusting the other users on that platform. So if you use Airbnb, how is trust built into Airbnb and Uber? You get to know who that person is with whom you are going to be exchanging services. Yeah? Um, so in this way, trust enables change and innovation. So first, um, I'll get to the second slide in a minute. 
there has been uh, you know a dramatic change in the way we manage trust or um, or or receive trust um, over the past 300 years because first of all trust was locally based in communities and it was accountability based so you know you trusted your neighbors or your local banks or your local representatives and religious leaders because you knew them personally and they knew you and you could judge their trustworthiness on an everyday basis very closely, as they could judge your trustworthiness. And in the 19th century, this changed dramatically um, with people moving to you know, very fastly growing big cities, and local people were replaced by large corporations who had no individual connection or knowledge of their clients. So we started to place our trust in the boxes of authority. We began to place trust in legal restrictions and regulations and contracts and insurance and less trust directly in other people. So trust became institutional. And there has been a lot of discussion about the declining trust people place in businesses and institutions today. And we've all heard of countless breaches of trust. You know, if you just think of the Volkswagen um, emissions scandal, or the widespread abuse in the Catholic Church, or the almost daily breaches of our personal information by Google and Yahoo and other online programs. And if you remember back in 2008 in the global financial crisis, only one banker was sent to jail. You know, So our trust is being tested on different levels and maybe more intensely now because technology is facilitating that. At the same time, there have been you know, increasingly vocal and numerous voices and groups that say they're fed up with distrustful elites. And what is running deeper than this feeling of distrust in institutions is the fact that trust in institutions was never designed for a digital age. Conventions of how trust is built and managed, lost and repaired in entire systems has been turned upside down by the technology. And this is predominantly very frightening um, to corporate brands and to governing institutions. So the way trust flows through societies is changing, creating a big shift away from the 20th century where we had institutional trust that was opaque, closed, centralized, top-down, and linear to the 21st century where in some cases Trust is more distributed, distributive, transparent, inclusive, decentralized, accountable, and bottom-up. And if you look at this, so this is just a slide that kind of shows in a graphic way the evolution of trust over since the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st century. So there will be, of course, um, cases of abuses, abuses of this distributive trust. Um, and if you just think of Uber that I mentioned, every day, five million people take an Uber. And in China, that number goes up to 11 million rides a day. Maybe not recently, but on average, 11 million rides a day. And how do we then construct or give our trust over to a, an app, basically, called Uber? And when Uber passengers are uh, you know, um, interviewed, they, both, they say that because both the passengers and the drivers can see a person's name and photo and their rankings makes them feel safer when they get into the car and when the driver takes on a passenger. I think that's really interesting. So, you know, the distributive nature of our ability to acquire trust is again individualized but distributed. So we are trying in a way to combine you know, the best of the local knowledge of a person or an institution with, the with what the technology provides us with. So providing a personal connection with a new service that the technology enables. So this is one example of how technology is creating trust in ways on a scale that has never been known before. You know, I mean, uh, 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 the things that you see, the amount of um, 
of exchanges online these days of services is, is quite phenomenal. So um, the real disruption is that what is happening is not technological, but it's a shift I propose to more transparent and inclusive and accountable systems, which that 20th century approach, putting our trust in boxes, didn't accomplish. So I just want to conclude um, with a few kind of overarching thoughts. I mean, trusting is hard. It's, it's hard to trust. And it's hard to know who to trust, and it's even harder, especially in the complex and interconnected world that we live in today. So none of us knows what might happen, even in the next minute. Who knows what will happen here in Gersay? But we still go forward somehow, because we trust, and because we have faith. And so I think that we need to remember that even in the new context that technology is providing us, we still look back to our, our basic instincts about how we earn trust and how we acquire um, the knowledge of a person or an institution's trustworthiness. Okay. <laughs>